Yeah. Um, so this will be familiar to, to Chica. We're in Japan um, and as it happens, we're in a Zen garden. So this is um, a very tame version of, or tamed version of nature. And the kind of um, scenario that I was living within um, when I did my first field work in Japan in the early 90s, late 80s, um, staying in Zen temples. Well, this device is called a shishi odoshi um, and was originally just uh, um, for scaring wild boar away from the territory of, of farmers. Um, but it's become something that's a signature sound for Zen gardens because the periodic sound of the tube filling up with water and then clunking down um, uh, creates a sense of what the whole space that you're listening to is for. Um, so it's part of what Zen gardens are designed to be about for the people who go there and the people who live um, um, within them when they're, when they're practicing um, various kinds of Zen practice. So I was staying in a, in, in a Zen temple, firstly in Kyoto and then um, in, in an island um, off the mainland in Shikoku. So these are very kind of um, uh, designed sounds in, in the landscape and part of an impression of Japan that I had before I went and a part of an impression of Japan that lots of people share. It was kind of an exotic idea about Japan that quite excited me when I was a teenager in London and I was practicing a martial art. Um, and that was the first thing that, a kind of version of Aikido, that was the first thing that got me interested when I got to, invited to do field work as part of my undergraduate degree. To go to Japan. Um, about why I would choose to go there. I thought I'd go and have a look and see whether the things I'd, I'd, I'd been um, imagining about it were anything like um, what it would be on the ground. And if you go to a place like Kyoto and you go to a Zen temple and you're listening to sounds like this, then it, it can pretty much um, confirm um, your observations um, or your imagination. So um, moving along. This is um, me amongst the uh, various things I got up to. And the scariest thing about that top left picture is the date. <laughs> um, so this is, this is practicing the tea ceremony. Um, so I, besides being in Zen gardens, um, I was learning tea ceremony and flower arranging. So all very kind of traditional, quite conservative pursuits. Um, and you'll see there my teacher is sort of imitating is showing me or, or mimicking what it, I should be doing with my, with my hands. And the sounds in those spaces are again, really designed in. Um, so the sounds of the, of, the, of the steam coming out of the pot and, and of, the, of the tea being whisked around in the bowl, all these things have, have a lot of significances and are written about um, in literature. Um, they feature in, in other media as well. Um, so very kind of uh, symbolic, uh, uh, really rich um, sounds. Once I finished that field work, I, I got up to some completely different projects. So if you look carefully at the, at the bottom right picture, there's an odd person on the far left, <laughs> pretending to be kind of Darth Vader impression with the helmet, okay? So, so that's me taking part in the um, anniversary reenactment of the Battle of Sekigahara. Um, <laughs> uh, as part of a project on copying in Japan. So I got very interested in, in, um, in why we think, another idea, why do we think of Japan as a place where people copy it? Or what does copying mean? And what are all the different things that copying involves? So reenactment was, was, was one of the things I, um, I was interested in. So at that point, I wasn't particularly involved in being in spaces and being in activities that had these really special kinds of symbolically rich sounds about them. That changed when I, I thought about doing a new project um, that going back to, to the Zen temples, going back to the Zen environments that I worked in to begin with, um, and, and focusing on the kind of sound I played you at the beginning and, and, and doing some research about that. So I went to, to see um, somebody in, in Kyoto, a professor at the university who was recommended to me 
um, Professor Hiramatsu um, featured here. Uh, he likes hats a lot. Um, and uh, we met in, in Kyoto and went for a beer and he told me all about his research, which was based in airports and US air bases in Japan. And he's an, an acoustician. So he's looking at how you measure the noise of aircraft in these spaces and why that's important for the people who live around them um, who may be contesting the effects of exposure to, from that noise on their health and their livelihood. And that's actually particularly the case in, in the prefecture where, where Chika's from, um, with an airport called Narita, which is Japan's first international airport, um, where there was a big protest when the airport was first built about the impact um, of, of, of the airport on the, on the local um, rural economy and and on and through noise on on people's um, everyday health, so we began a collaboration um, starting about 14, 15 years ago. And I guess that's something that anthropologists um, do in their field work is that there'll be somebody or maybe more than one person with whom um, they have a they develop a special relationship. It might be their particular informant in a space that they go to, but in, in, in this case, it was it was more than that because he was a collaborator in, in the research process. You know, he was telling me things about the subject um, and uh, also uh, we were collaborating um, on, on doing projects together. Um, so we've done projects um, all the way up and continuing today um, in the mainland of Japan um, um, and in Okinawa. Okinawa, you'll see on the picture um, on the left. And our first project together, um, big project um, involved this airport, um, Narita, um, where there's only one, well, two farmers, as it happens, who actually live inside the, the precincts of, of, of the airport. Um, this is a farm right in the middle, um, and the planes land 130 to 140 times a day over, over, their, over their house. Um, they have a small farm holding, and they're the last of the farmers of what was a community that moved there just after the war. They were given the land to, to cultivate. Um, and we got a project together um, to look at the effects of noise on the health and the operation of, of this farm, right in the middle of this big international airport. So there was this farm that had this um, relationship to the seasons, with growing crops, with cultivate, with, with um, rearing animals, there's some pigs and some chickens. Um, in the middle of this airport with all of this activity of, of international flights going on. Um, and you can see here um, just exactly how isolated that, that farm is, it's in the blue um, block um, uh, marked out on, on this picture. So the planes land just over the, over the um, farm and then go around and taxi into the, the main runway. <clears throat> and we lived on the farm um, together with um, the family who were there um, since, 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 the, um, since, in fact, the, the war. Um, and we um, worked with uh, the man on the far left of this picture who had been um, responsible for the air with the airport authority and the local council in coordinating how the local community were, were, were dealt with. Um, and the person at the very back of the picture who's a sound artist. So the idea here was doing um, very intensive short-term anthropological field work um, alongside this person, um, Professor Hiramatsu, who was an acoustician, so he was doing the science part. And then this person at the back with the glasses, Angus, who was a sound artist. So it's combining all of these things together to make a piece of work that would go towards um, a public audience. I wanted to put things into the pub into a public space. Um, so um, that involved um, looking at lots of different spaces on the farm, making recordings, um, looking at how sound was measured. So this is a special microphone that measures. So you can see here all the different sound levels. Um, 
of, of the sounds going on all around the outside of this farm. This is a bamboo grove at the back of the farm. Um, and taking that data um, and putting it into, um, a, in this case, um, a medium of a film. Um, so here, the, the big blue blob is the sound volume turned into a, um, a graphic visual image. So the, the more blue it is, the louder the sound is. <coughs> and, the, and you can see it moving across the, um, the space. And so we used that in creating an art installation that was in the Whitworth Gallery in Manchester for about four months and then went all around the world. Um, we made a CD. Um, it's now in the National Science Foundation in Washington, DC, um, and it plays out on a, on, on a loop there. Um, and so this was the first of our big collaborations and it's a, it was a way of working that I really enjoyed because it was about putting something into a public domain and engaging lots of different kinds of, um, of audiences. Then we went to do the longest, uh, we, uh, we, then we started doing what's become the longest um, bit of our research together, which is in Okinawa. So this is a US airbase, the biggest airbase in East Asia, built just after the end of the war. Um, and this was a space um, that's very contested with the people who all live around the edges of the airbase now, but who used to have land on the base. So some of them have family graves, they have family land that they can still, in some cases, go on and farm. So that the whole politics of, of what the US presence in Japan is about um, plays out around spaces like this because people still contest the presence of these bases. And one of the ways they do that is because of the sound of these aircraft flying overhead <clears throat> continuously. Um, and these are a couple of jets <coughs> flying out of the um, air base of Kadena. And they're particularly active at the moment because of the um, the politics of the <clears throat> situation with China and the East China, the contested territory in the East China Sea. So my collaborator Hiramatsu, he'd spent a long time in the 90s doing a big detailed survey of all the health effects of on these communities around the air base. And one of the things he found is that people have memories of the war. Uh, people um, who either themselves or their family members um, were involved in the war in some way. Um, they had their memories um, or post what's called post memories because it's mem remembered through their family members activated by the sounds of these jets continuously flying overhead. So we worked together making some recordings on the spaces like this, which is a beach where, to, where the planes fly over um, every day. This is right at the end of the, the main runway. We looked at you know, the ideas that, that are going on on the base about you know, what, what, does these, what do these overflying jet sounds mean? Um, so in this case, beside the runway of the main um, um, uh, the main runway on the airbase, there's a, um, a plaque that says the, the planes that fly off from here for us here working on this base, um, these sounds are the sounds of freedom. Of course, they're not for the Okinawans who live around the base. So that, that was a, um, another way into, into the, the story that these sounds could tell about um, the occupation of this land, but also a much bigger story about these bases all over the world. Um, so taking um, these sounds that a bit like those, Zen, those sounds in the Zen garden, they're kind of deliberately part of the operation of these spaces and they happen regularly and they have a significance for the people who live um, and work or visit there. Um, but then the people, these sounds leak out of the spaces and they have different significances sometimes for the people round about. So then we looked at um, all the other sounds that go on um, around these bases. So every morning um, you can hear from this base sounds of um, 
cleverly. So you wake up in the morning um, and you hear the uh, bugle call. Which of course, if you're, you know, somebody whose land is occupied by these Americans, you, you might feel, feel quite, quite um, annoyed about. Um, so this is one of the one of the sounds again, like the aircraft that we recorded, and then we went to spaces like this, which are very um, traumatic places, caves where Okinawans uh, civilians hid during the Battle of Okinawa, and um, sites of mass suicides um, where civilians, in, in some cases, kill, um, killed were killed or killed themselves <clears throat> on the instructions of Japanese um, military. And um, we made recordings there with the permission of, of, of local people. So we made a lot of different sorts of recordings overall and worked together with local people like, like this person um, who's a survivor of, of the Battle of Okinawa. Um, and um, here he is recording with us um, in the cave at the bottom picture, which is where he in fact sat when he was 11 years old with his family during the bombardment um, by the Americans um, of his village. And then on the top picture, this is where he used to go, where he escaped to, um, but then where he subsequently on weekends would go with his wife in the post-war period on hiking trips in the north of the island. Um, we made, um, uh, film and video, we made lots of different recordings. This is um, my collaborator interviewing local people. We looked at the, um, the broad area of like, all, so if you're looking at these particular sounds, we thought, well, what other, you know, what are the other sounds going on all around that? Um, we got interested in what Olakinawa is really known, well known for, which are the, um, the musical sounds people, um, Often individuals and families are, are creating uh, playing um, folk songs, um, and there's a style of, of singing and dancing called Asa, um, uh, which local communities um, play and then compete every year in a festival for, uh, with. Um, and so we made some recordings of these. And we did two things with all of that. Um, one was to make some films, um, which we could again put into, into public space. Um, this is one film and I'll show you in a minute. Um, the next slide, I'll show you a short TV clip from Japan, which was all about that film and the reception when we showed it in Japan. And then we put all of the sound recordings at the same time into an archive, um, which is being finished at the moment. And so an archive is a way that lots of people in, from li libraries or, um, other spaces in, anywhere in the world can get access to, um, to, to, to to see how all of these sounds relate together. So this was a, a this next piece is a little um, sequence from NHK TV, which tells you about um, how people in Okinawa thought about the work when we took it there. Most films use soundtracks to help tell their stories, but our next piece is about sounds that made a film itself. A British-Japanese co-production shot in Okinawa relies on everyday noises to showcase life in the southwestern prefecture. NHK World's Taiki Toma has more. A prayer to the ocean against the rhythmic hissing of the waves. A ceremony for good fishing with the clapping of boat paddles. The sounds of Okinawa are the theme of this film. Produced by a team including British anthropologist Rupert Cox, the film is part research project, part artistic exploration. It aims to look at how Okinawan people experience life through sounds. When we make recordings, we can help us ourselves to understand the differences between how people in one place sense the place that they live in and compare that to how people in another place. Okinawa hosts the heaviest concentration of U.S. military bases in Asia. 
When Cox first visited here 12 years ago, he was surprised by the lure of low-flying aircraft. Fighter jets and other planes came constantly over residential areas. The noise dominates everything. It even drowns out the ocean and conversation. This space is a place where American military power and Okinawan life come together every day. We have to learn to listen to very carefully and to make recordings so we can understand what is special about this place. Even peaceful sounds carry baggage. At Japan's only site of land battles in World War II, Okinawa has a tragic past. The last thing of sugarcane fields is a noise that many people find soothing. But Cox found the same sound triggers intense feelings in local people who survived the Battle of Okinawa. This is 84-year-old Tamotsu Tokeshi. He says the whispering cane fields evoked the time peace before the war, a way of life destroyed by the fierce fighting. I heard the noise of shells fired from battleships whistling through the air and huge explosions when they landed. Cox says the sounds people no longer notice are reaching clues about what the community has been through and where it stands today. The noise of the military planes is actually really disturbing, but somehow I've grown used to it. People can realize a certain understanding about Okinawa. They can experience something of the um, unique sound world, the way that we work by making recordings and combining our perspectives is a way to give people back the sounds that they hear already. The 15-minute film is called Zawawa. The world itself is the sound onomatopoeia for the noise of the cane leaves and one that can mean many different things. Taiki Toma, NHK World, Naha. Okay, so um, that's work that um, is still um, ongoing, but um, sort of reaching a, a, a conclusion. And, and what it did was um, consolidate for me the um, interest in in sound in um, in ways which could allow collaborations across lots of different um, um, domains. So working with scientists, working with artists, working with members of the public. And in the projects I'm doing now, um, I'm working with different kinds of, of scientists, environmental scientists and biological scientists. And it's an extension of, of the things that, that um, I've been doing before. Um, but the sounds in this case um, are natural sounds of the environment, um, uh, uh, sounds that are threatened by um, climate change um, and by um, various forms of, 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 of human activity. So this is work that um, began with a collaboration with a PhD student of mine who's from Colombia, um, who's now back in Colombia. He was originally a biological scientist himself. Um, and what we've been doing is um, looking at uh, um, the sounds of the natural environment that people, everyday people, as well as biological scientists hear, and they have a certain kind of knowledge, different kinds of knowledge um, based on, on, on how they live with those sounds. So from farmers, people in cities, and as I say, the, 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 the scientists as well. But also, in fact, in Colombia, ex-combatants, so people who used to be um, part of the civil, um, civil war in, in Colombia. So making a big network of people who are all making recordings. Um, so we've been giving them um, different kinds of recorders to, to make recordings. And then they share them um, with the biological scientists who, um, who interpret them um, using 
um, particular software that tells you what the, um, the behavior of the species is doing, and this is really important, so you know how it's changing um, because of things that are changing in the environment. So that's one level um, of, of, of the work. So this is just one of the, the many, many recordings we have. If you go to this, this site, cuckoosonic.net, um, then you can see lots of other, other recordings and, and pictures um, that we have there. And then the, the, um, the other aspect is to try and put this as much as possible into, into public space. And so we've been working with um, a, a, an organization based at Manchester called In Place of War. Um, so this began as a research project in the drama department by Professor James Thompson. It's now an independent charity and they work in conflict zones um, all around the world. And they use arts, um, dramatic arts, visual arts, um, music, um, to engage people um, who've been impacted by, by, um, by conflict in, in one way or another. Um, and they have a, they have a, a base in, in, in Medellin in, in Colombia. So through them, we've worked with a, with a large group of, of, of international um, uh, musicians, um, which as of yesterday includes now um, Brian Eno um, and Martin Ware from, from Human League um, and um, people like um, the LA based rapper, Buddy, um, also, um, Igor Cavalera, who was a, a big, uh, very big um, um, phenomenon, almost, I, I guess, a, a phenomenon throughout Latin America from the 80s in a heavy metal band called Sepultura in, in Brazil and his partner, Leima Leighton. And um, even with groups like Finger Thing, um, who, so together, we've got nine or 10 different international artists now. And there'll be an album coming out with Vinyl Factory, um, based, which is a, a production company based in London um, sometime in the next few months. So um, this is the part that you can't record. Um, um, and um, as I said, there's quite a, a large assembly of them now from different artists and they've taken very different elements of, 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 the, um, of the natural um, soundscape um, and species recordings that at one level, the scientists are analyzing um, using particular kinds of bioacoustic software and that's feeding into to, to, to their particular work. But at another level um, are about how the networks that the people involved um, are being activated and, and what they're doing in making connections between people on, on the ground. So less about the sound than about the relationships between people by creating the network that, that they're part of. Um, and and make, making um, uh, the, the, the individuals and in some of the communities more visible than they might otherwise be in, to, to a wider audience because of that. Um, and then, then, then there's the musical element as well, which is, part of a, another kind of story which has to do with um, ultimately with biodiversity and, and climate change. So, the, so the, the, the thing is operating at lots of different levels. So that, that, that's the kind of thing that I've, I've really liked about working with sound and working with all the different collaborations I've, I've described. So I'll, I'll stop there if there are any questions. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I absolutely love the collaboration between um, anthropology and sound. And I, you know, I'm very interested in music as well. So I think using that um, medium of sound uh, to, to tell us something about how people live is, is really, really interesting. Um, I kind of wanted to know more about how you, like why you, it was so important for you to get that into the public space um, and about how it was working with the sound artists. Um. Well, partly it's it's um, circumstance and opportunity. Um, so initially, it wasn't anything that I had thought about. But the people that I met when I first began to do this work um, in Japan were already involved in in um, in work that was very public anyway. So the acoustician, the acoustics uh, scientist that I was working with, so all all of his work was, and it was 
very political as a consequence, was directed towards um, working in a legal framework by making reports that went into uh, cases that um, citizens groups were then using to get compensation for health effects. So things were, were operating already in a, in, a public, in, a, in, a, in a public space. And again, uh, besides him, the other person that I met at, at the same time early on was a sound artist, um, uh, Angus Carlyle, who works in University of the Arts in London. And we, we, we work really well together and, uh, as, a, as a three person team. Um, and we found that by working together, we could do things that would cross over into the science, into the art domain, and even into, into the anthropology. So it was um, an effective way of doing work that could do, do lots of things potentially at the same time, because by sharing the different expertise that you had, you could combine ways of doing things quite efficiently in short spaces of time, because you know, sometimes you don't get much time to go and do field work. Um, and put things together. And we could also make this work that we did together operate um, in lots of different spaces, so to different audiences. So it was a kind of outcome of the collaboration, really, the, the peculiar nature of, of, of the collaboration and the fact that the collaboration worked. Collaborations don't necessarily always work or last. Um, this collaboration did work and last. And between us, we found different sorts of audiences to, to put our work into. Um, so by myself, I wouldn't, without those other people, have necessarily been able to do that. Um, but, I, but that's what I, I like about having a role as part of, a, as part of something that's, that's bigger than the thing that I do only, only myself um, and what my work contributes to you know, as part of a bigger picture. There's problems that come with that as well because there's responsibilities that, that follow from when your work as an anthropologist starts doing work, you know, in, in another space um, where it might not mean um, quite the same things that you intended it to mean when you're thinking of it as anthropology, right? So when things become a music track and like, like what you've just heard and start to go out and do things, then there'll be other questions that follow from that. So, so there's a, it becomes quite a complex picture and you have to be aware of, of when these things go out and circulate of, of, of where your work becomes something else. Um, and, and, and it engages, you know, for example, that album might engage a, a very large number of people, but, but the anthropology bit will probably be quite a small layer underneath, but, but somewhere you have to try and make sure that, that, you, make, that you keep hold of it and that it's, it's playing a role, that it's significant. Or this thing's in the chat. Any other questions? Um, I'm just looking at Elizabeth's question in the chat. Yeah, the um, the, the 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 album should be um, in production fairly soon. So um, in the next couple of months, there'll be. Um, some publicity about it, but the place to look to see that will be on the website of the group that we have in uh, that we have in Colombia called Cuckoo Sonic, um, but also the group that we're working with in Place of War. So they um, they will have the full list of the artists involved, you know, of the musical artists. Rupert, um, how did you how do you deal with language? when you, you do research? Do you have to set up a, an interpreter before you go out there or is... Well, the, the, yeah, so the Columbia work is not my, I don't, I've never, <laughs> I've never worked there before. That was um, really an initiative that came from this ex-PhD student um, and a project that he did uh, and me finding a, a small grant that I... Oh used to enable them to do the work. And this is particularly, um, in, I guess, interesting because of the pandemic. So I don't go to, I, I'm not there. I don't do any of the field work. Um, basically, I'm just trying to manage the money, getting to all the places that it, 
enables them to do the work there, uh, that getting equipment and, and, and such like. Um, so with the, with the Japan work, um, yeah, all, I mean, I do the field work in a, in a regular way. So do, the, do all the interviews and conversations in, in Japanese. And, you know, when I get lost, because Okin in Okinawa, the dialects can be quite strong. So I, you know, I can rely on my collaborator to help me out um, there. Um, and I guess the, in a sense, the other language difficulty that comes up is is the kinds of science is another you know that we're dealing with with acoustics and bioacoustics so there's a whole language of, of the science of sound also uh, besides the language of japanese or, yeah. or spanish so i rely on the people i work with um, oh. in that regard as well yeah cool thanks i have a question about um kind of your methods in the field, I guess, like when you went out and decided to do the different recordings, was it a situation where you kind of had fully realized each of the different places you were gonna go beforehand or whether like you went to one place and that kind of naturally led you to another? No, it's, um, it, it's, it's partly planned and has to be because there's short periods of time that we're working within. So you have to be productive and you have to have the things that are going to lead you to the outcome that you know that you've got to produce at the end of it. Um, but it's also partly responsive. Um, and over time, it's always responsive because you, you hear and see um, things that you can go back to and, and develop. So, um, Initially in, in, um, in Okinawa, uh, we were just working around an airbase and we were dealing with the sounds of aircraft and the sounds related to the sounds of aircraft. So, you know what, so in, this, in the literal vicinity of this space, there are these aircraft sounds, there are sound, other sounds from the base, um, and then there are sounds around the lives of the people who hear and respond to those sounds of the bass. So that it's, it, it's a quite a, um, a contained um, environment and you, you can quite quickly start to work out what sorts of things you're going to be asking about or, or recording. But then the further we get into it, you realize there are all these remembered sounds and imagined sounds, sounds that aren't actually in the space, but people remember from before, or you know, uh, people, people miss because they, they've disappeared. Um, or people have from a pla from another place, but they they that are connected to this place. You know that places they go at the weekend um, because they can escape the sounds of jets. So then you then you get into a whole much broader, wider range of things you can get into um, recording, and that that's kind of where we went into in Okinawa towards the end, which is all the sounds, as it were, in the imagination or in the memory of people. So they they're not literally in the place that. You're working in but they're remembered or imagined from elsewhere um and then the the you know with the um, with with the, with the project in in colombia that's that's very that's also in a sense responsive to what's possible in the spaces that people are in because they're you know in stages, situations of lockdown so it's what you hear from your from your house from your window from your from where you can go in your neighborhood um and what you can do with those recordings when you share them. So the idea is that you can't, you might not be able to, you know, to hear a lot from where you are, but by sharing the things that you hear and record from one place with things that people hear and re record from another place and you putting them all together, um, you can create a, a mosaic, a picture that is made sense of partly through science, um, but then also can be interpreted um, musically. Um, so it's, yeah, partly it's anticipated, partly it's responsive, and partly it's just um, an organic proce um, process of, of thinking about things that you could then go and do the next time and the next time. So it, it, it's, it's not a process that will ever end. You know, there's, al there's always something to, uh, further to do. One of the last things I did in Okinawa, for example, was record the sounds of, of Shuri Castle in Naha, so the main city of Naha. There's a, a castle there that's, um, I guess, really the symbolic center of, of the Ryukyu kingdom, of, of the whole, um, of that island and the islands around it. 
And two weeks after I left the last time, it burnt down. So, and it, it's burnt down periodically in the past, in the war, um, it, 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 it was destroyed. But I have these sounds of this space, of the doors, of things happening in it, that now are like ghosts, because the, the place is, is burned down. So one of the things I'm, I'm, I, I would like, I'm trying to think about doing in the future is, you know, what do you do with those sounds? How do you work with them? And how do you make something of them with people who are local there now? Because there are these sounds of this space that people visited, lived around, worked in, um, that holds you know, tremendous value in, in different ways. Um, but isn't isn't there anymore? With your um, the way that you've presented your work with now with the music, but also in the past with the art installations, which way have you found is the most is your favourite or is the most effective for kind of getting your ethnographic point across, but also just your favourite way to present them? Well, I. Um, there's, there's two things to say about that. There's uh, the, the fact that uh, all this work that I've, I've been talking about um, uh, is a reflection of the fact that I enjoy the collaborations. <laughs> so, you know, I really enjoy working that way and I, I, I like um, the work that we produce out of it. Um, how it translates into um, an the field of anthropology and how it translates into ethnography is a bit more complex. So there, there is, a, there is a, um, an area of anthropology where people work with artists and artists work with, with ideas about what anthropology is and what ethnography is. Um, but it's a, bit mar you know, it's a bit marginal. And so it's, 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 it can be difficult to make that kind of work stick, to have the same value, say, as if, you're, um, you're writing an ethnography in a more traditional way. Um, and writing, you know, is, is the traditional way to present um, anthropological work in ethnography. So if you're working with film and you're working with art installations and you're working with sound, there are lots of things that are going to, you know, you can really enjoy it. You can see how the work is, has a value in, in various ways, but you have to also understand that the value that it has within the discipline um, is more, you know, is, is, is more complicated. Um, and so you have to demonstrate what part of the discipline it's, it's valuable to and, and, how it, and how it does that. Um, you know, in Manchester, because we have the Granada Centre of Visual Anthropology, we have a place where people have been making films for a long time and doing other things. Um, you know, there's, there's more um, acknowledgement and more knowledge about, you know, how that, how that kind of work works. Um, and there's a, there's a growing field of people elsewhere as well, not just in Manchester, who, who work with artists who do art and anthropology um, combined. But yeah, it, it's, um, you, you have to continuously show, because it's not obvious necessarily or automatic, okay, how's this, you know, how, you know what part of this is, is, is is ethnography in the ways that is, is recognizable to people in the anthropology community, you know, um, and how's that going? Um, I had a question. Do you feel like your work and the sort of public engagement that it involves is contributing to kind of um, bursting the bubble um, of academia? and more specifically anthropology, um, which is kind of like an elite bubble, I feel. Um, do you feel like it's contributing to that effort? Well, I, I think actually, you know, all my colleagues here in Manchester and, and many, many, most even of the people that I know of as anthropologists elsewhere, that, you know, it's in the nature of the discipline and how we work, um, but also, in the way that people use their work, they are they are involved in in, in, in with the with the public, um, in 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 many ways. Um, it's not necessarily always so obvious because of 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 how they um, by and large perhaps you know have to have to present their work and and, and what the what that work looks like you know to 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 you and to to other people. Um, 
but actually in the, in the course of, of them doing their work and and what the work is and how and where it goes there are there are different publics that that, that get involved but i um so I, I think i think in one sense there's a question about your question because um you know the the bubble is i think always being expanded or or burst in in different ways by people working with different sorts of ideas of, of, of publics um but um the kind of public that my work goes into is is i guess one in which you know lots of different you know it's, it's quite broad you know you, you get a, a, an album with you know big name artists in it and suddenly it it, it starts to do lots of things in in, in in a in, in a very big kind of media space, um, and it, it can engage um, a, a wide idea of what the public is. Uh, that's true, um, but um, as far as you know, I don't have a. Um, I I like traditional ethnography. I like the idea of a discipline, and but I and I think it's important. Um, and I think you know this discipline is is the, the disciplinary idea of a discipline. Has real has real value, but at the same time, um, interdisciplinary and you know public facing work um, uh, is is also has value. Um, the question in both cases is is, is it any good? <laughs> you know, uh, interdisciplinarity by itself or public facing work by itself, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it, you can do it well, you can do it badly. But the fact that it's outward facing doesn't mean that suddenly it, it necessarily has value because it's sort of trying to puncture the bubble, you know. Um, Do you have writing that goes along with your sound recordings? Yeah, always. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different layers. So, you know, there's the, the let's say the film and an installation, then there would be the writing on the on the outside of the installation when people go in that just tells you where are you what are you listening to what's going on why is why is this interesting then there's the article that you write about the project that led to the installation or the article you write about the installation um, then there may be the book you know that you write so there's the, you know and some of it's more academic um, at the moment i'm finishing an art book you know which is got pictures and sounds and connected to it and, and sort of more essay types of writing, essayistic diary types of write, different styles of writing involved. That's a, that's a different thing than, than a monograph, you know, um, and it, it, it does, um, it, it goes to different places and it says different things about the project. So, so yeah, there's always, there's always writing, but there's different kinds of writing. And does your writing interact with anthropological theory or is it more just you're just writing your own ethnography describing your experience? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Um, so there's, you know, there's an anthropology of sound um, and there's an anthropology of Japan. Um, there's a art and anthropology question. Um, so in terms of the region, you know, in terms of the discipline um, and in terms of the phenomena, the thing, sound, um, you know, those, they're, they're, they're a theoretical, they, these are all theoretical fields and, and you know, you, you engage with all of those. Um, all the time in all of these projects, I think it's really important that you, you have a context and that's clear, so you know why you're in one place and not anywhere. Um, that you have a process and that you know why you're choosing to work in this way or that way, and that you have outcomes that are varied and do the different things for the different types of audiences that you have. But you can link your ideas of, of, within anthropology um, to the method, to the context, the place that you're in, and to you know, where you want the, the work to go and how it's doing that. That's interesting. We were yesterday, we had a materiality uh, lecture and we were discussing sound as a material. Yeah. Do you ever talk about that in your work? Yeah, there's, there's, there's really sort of two, two ways to think about um, 
the anthropology of sound and, and all the work I've been, I've been talking about. On the one hand, it has a question about what the thing, what sound is. Um, so how, how we understand it as a phenomena um, and how it is understood in different places in different ways, you know, from um, environments in the rainforest or environments in, in cities um, and, and how different devices operate to measure it, to record it, to transmit it. But on the other side, there's perception. So there's sort of, there's the phenomena, you know, what it is, um, the question about identification, what's that sound? But the other side is, you know, how do we experience it? How do we feel about it? How, what meaning do we make of it? And so these two things are always working together. So some people like Tim Ingold are very much all about perception, you know? So sound exists only in as much as it's, it's there to be perceived and perception is where you start your, your questions. Um, whereas if you're working with people who do things about soundscape, who do think who are acousticians or some sound artists, you know, sound is a thing. It, it exists out there as, as something that you, you go and capture and you manipulate and then you put back into the world in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, there are people say, we talk about, well, it sounds at a fundamental level vibration. So it, it's not only what's audible through our ears, it's operating at a more um, fundamental level, you know, in, in, uh, through our bodies continuously. Um, in which case, you know, we're not just dealing with the audible spectrum, we're dealing with the ultrasonic, with high frequencies in the infrasonic and we're dealing with you know vibration and so that opens up a whole set of of, of other questions you know because um uh, and and then spaces is what, what you hear a sound is a consequence of the spaces that they occur in you know whether they're reflected or absorbed by by the by the materials of those spaces yeah but basically it's, it's useful if you think of these two things as sort of perception and questions about perception on the one hand, and meaning, and then the object, the thing, you know, what it is um, on the other hand. And there's always a, you know, there's always an oscillation between the two. Sure. You, you said about Tim Ingold and how he thinks about perception. He also talks about how our senses are on like a kind of like hierarchy where like visual is like more favored over sound and that sometimes visual can like separate you. Was that part of the reason that you focused on sound? Is that, that you find it like more personal or more like experiential? Um, no, not, no, not as, as such. I mean, I think the, the point about um, the senses all being interrelated in, in ways that either you understand as being a hierarchical perhaps because of a construction of culture um yeah it's is one thing um but um in in, in ingold's in ingold's case they're they're all interrelated in in a way that um where they where they merge um and um what what i've been doing is trying to think about how um what we see and what we hear and what we smell and what we touch and what we taste are all into are all are all interconnected in the spaces that, that that I've worked in. But starting with the question about sound, so sound is the, the thing um, and the and the and the aspect of perception that leads to all the other senses. Um, um, and lots of the things I'm 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 interested in are visualized so sound is visualized through scientific data it's um it's visualized because one of the ways we think about sound is being able to identify its origin visually so we know what it is you know it's a sound of a car of a plane of a thing that has a visual aspect to it so um audio vision the audio visual relationship is one of the things that um you know what how that works out um uh in 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 different ways is one of the things i'm i'm really interested in so with planes one of the things is you know you hear it often before you see it or you hear it without seeing it or you know one of the things with um that goes on now with planes is to do with drones 
drone warfare where you don't hear <laughs> you don't hear it until something explodes. Um, I've been, I'm writing a book which is about the history of military aircraft sound, um, and which is uh, an, an ethnography, you know, which has a lot to do with how overflying aircraft um, suddenly appear and disappear, and um, and what we what we think we should hear when we see an aircraft. So. If you look at film soundtracks, for example, what we think we should hear by what we see is quite different from what actually happens with sound if those things are actually there. Anyone know the film Top Gun? Tom Cruise, Top Gun? The sounds of the jets in Top Gun are actually the sounds of wildcats recorded at the local zoo. They're not jets at all. They're all animal sounds, so they'll be manipulated. So uh, what we perceive by what we should see, what we should hear when we see these jets flying around and Tom Cruise you know, shouting um, as a soundtrack is totally different to, to what the sounds of aircraft, as it were, actually are. You know? um, so there's a, the audio visual question about what we think we should hear by what we see and what we, what we see when we hear things and what we, you know, it, imagine in our heads by sounds, the, the visual uh, things that we have in our heads by sounds is, is, a, is a very interesting area. Okay. Um, are we, uh, any more questions or we run to time? Uh, it depends on your Availability, really. Uh, we can stop now because oh, I've got no, I can go till quarter past. So, okay. Um, it's not a question, more of a comment. Um, people have started making like fictional soundscapes now. Like I saw one on YouTube that was like sounds you would hear in Hogwarts, and like <laughs> I think it's quite a fun thing. Um, but I did want to ask a question, which I put in the chat, is just what do we have available at uni to explore these things more at undergraduate level, but then further as well. So um, as of this year, there's the undergraduate first year course, um, uh, which is the art, science, sound and image course. And right now with the first year students, I'm doing um, a five week block on the anthropology of sound. Then in the um, MA in visual anthropology program, there's a course um, called um, Documentary and Sensory Media, where we deal with the practice of sound recording um, and go into much more detail about um, the use of sound in anthropology and interdisciplinary uses of sound. Um, and then in Andrew Irving's um, course, Images, Text and Field Work, he also um, deals with them. Um, with, 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 with sound as well. And one of, the, you know, one of the ways that we're always dealing with sound in anthropology is, is voice. Um, you know, we're, we're making recordings of people. Um, so we're always dealing with voice. We're listening to voices and recording voices. Um, so voice is a primary sound element of, of, of anthropology continually you know, all the time. Um, but those are, the, yeah, so those, those, those three courses particularly the, the first year undergraduate one and the MA level one. I used to have a, a third year option, um, which was a, a 10 week anthropology of sound course, um, but that's not on the books at the moment, unfortunately, but um, um, that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, the fictional soundscape thing's interesting. If you're interested in that, there's a, you should look, Look, look up about the sounds of Star Wars. There's a whole thing about, about the sounds of Star Wars. Um, so the, the lightsabers in Star Wars are the sounds of the LA freeway um, recorded through the end of the Hoover and speed it up. Cool. <laughs> so somebody thought of that. <laughs> Whoever did is a genius. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we have a question uh, in the chat from Elizabeth. Um, how do you include sound in a book or article? Um, as a link, often. Um, so you can write about what sound does, its effects, 
but you can't really write about what sound is very well, very easily. And um, the, the person who um, developed this in anthropology and really where the whole field of the anthropology of sound comes from is Stephen Feld, who's an American anthropologist, now retired, a sound artist. Um, and in the 1970s, he started working in Papua New Guinea. Um, he was a jazz musician. He'd worked in radio. Um, and he made recordings as part of the ethnography that he also wrote. Um, and he made recordings because he recognized that you can't write aspects of sound. But if you make recordings, the way that you make the recordings, what the recordings are and how you use them and how you make them connect with what you write. Um, and then also where you put them uh, into exhibitions, these all allow different kinds of understandings um, uh, in an ethnographic way. So just last year, he finished um, a remixing of his recordings from the 1970s, in an album called Voices of the Rainforest, which was supported when he originally did it by the Grateful Dead. So the Grateful Dead are this iconic 70s rock band, um, and they um, supported his they used to play his sounds of the rainforest in the intervals to the Grateful Dead concerts. Um, and he met George Lucas out of that time in the 70s who, and got really good recording gear. And so the last year he finished a 7.1, so an eight channel remix of his sounds of the rainforest that was remixed at Skywalker Ranch, um, courtesy of George Lucas by the sound designer taking time off from Star Wars. <laughs> so, you, you know, so you've got this amazing um, sound design. So, so in that case, in fact, for him, it's become a whole ethnography of sound designers. You know, how do sound designers do their work in, in the Hollywood industry? Um, but you can, if you go onto YouTube, um, uh, you, can, you can see, and, and Steve and Feld, if you look at his website, um, Steve Feld, um, then you can see, um, and get links to to that stuff that he did. He's done a film as well recently. Okay. It's quarter past now, so I think I don't know if you need to go. Um, unless there are any last questions. Um, I mean, I think this this whole intersection, like you were saying before, about the interdisciplinary um aspect of, of creating the the sound ethnography um i just think i find that really interesting because it kind of adds this new aspect of of exploring uh, a space and, and people that you know you'll never meet but you can experience it through the the art do you think that kind of adds a new value to it at least for, for people who maybe aren't anthropologists and they go to to view your work do you think maybe that adds um, well, th at the moment, so the, the thing about the project in Colombia that motivates me more than anything else is it's dealing with an existential issue for all of us, you know, it's dealing with biodiversity and climate change. And I don't know anything, not like Pete Wade, or, you know, I don't know anything in, about Colombia in the, in the same way. I'm not a biological scientist, and I'm not a musician, but I do understand about how collaborations can work and how you can put, put people together and how you can make things connect across different ways of working as a musician, as a scientist, you know, and people on the ground out of these projects. And so what motivates me there is that I'm making some kind of a contribution to a public understanding of biodiversity and climate change. And, and that's the main thing. And actually that's much more important to me there than, than even the ethnography question. You know, I, I know that there's bits of, of that work I can I can take and put into an academic paper about how you do this kind of collaborative interdisciplinary work. Um, there's maybe something that will come out that's a bit about this kind of ethnographic, but, but I haven't made any of the recordings, haven't done any of the interviews. I've, I've just been about the process of doing the ethnography, but not the ethnography itself, you know, the ethnographic, ethnographic bits itself. But I don't, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. What, you know what I like about it is it's just it it is getting something really direct in into making connections between people in a space um, and 
putting work out that just generates, you know, um, a certain kind of consciousness and and hopefully some kind of you know some kind of change it's just it's really that it's, it's, you know that and i, and I get I, I think that's for me that's really important that's really great so um you know the the ethnographic anthropology bit but it, it hasn't i haven't really worried about it too much yet um that's really great i think it's great especially with all the current climate activism going on to have a project yeah. like that. it's definitely very important yeah i mean yeah um and, and i know a lot of colleagues feel the same way it's like you know how do you how do you make the thing that you do do something necessary um but uh, you know people people can only do it in, in the ways that their work allows them to and you know so that you know sometimes it's not so visible but i but it is actually you know it is actually going on um but maybe at a different level than than, people, than you're aware of but um and you know this so making a big album with these big names is obviously you know very high profile but but the actual anthropology bit for me is very low profile <laughs> so <laughs> all, right. all right yeah thank you okay. so much for this okay well thanks for inviting me i hope you enjoyed it um do do you know do, don't please make sure that the, the musical bit doesn't go out because that, that would get me into trouble. Um, so yeah, just keep that off. All right. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.